And every now, every month, I receive my CPF statement. Uh, I feel so rich, you know. Yeah. And the best part is I know the CPF money won't run away. Yeah, CPF will still be around, hopefully, uh, for a long, long time to come. <laughs> Not hopefully, la, for sure, la, for sure, for a long, long time to come. This slip of tongue by the union chief underscore the reality of how undependable the CPF has become to meet the retirement needs of Singaporeans. Many fear that their CPF money will eventually remain untouchable, regardless of the amount in their accounts. With all these years of changes to the CPF, creating multiple accounts and adding more complex schemes, many are wondering why it is still not adequate in meeting Singaporeans' basic retirement needs. To answer that question, we have identified several factors that affect the adequacy of the CPF savings. The first, and probably the most critical, is inflation. From 2000 to 2006, inflation was relatively stable in Singapore. On 1st July 2007, the government raised GST to 7%, this trigger off sharp increases in consumer prices. As prices continue to surge unabated, Singapore's inflation rate hit 6.6% in 2008, the highest for 25 years. This resulted in Singapore becoming the 10th most expensive city in the world. However, what is more worrying, is that the lower income group, are the hardest hit by the rising inflation. To illustrate the seriousness of this problem, let's take this fair price range of rice, which is popular among the lower income family. In March 2008, a 5 kilograms packet is selling for $3.95. A year later in March 2009, the retail price has jumped to $6.95. This is a staggering 75.9% increase. The second factor is the low interest earned from the CPF savings. CPF started off in 1955 with interest of 2.5%. It rises through the years and reached 6.5% between 1974 to 1985. From 1986 onwards, interest rates started to decline as the government began to make changes to the scheme. Today, CPF rate is back to 1955 level of 2.5%. Beside tinkering with the CPF account, the government has also made changes to the MetaSave account, converting fixed interest rate of 4% to the long-term bond rate. As this rate is variable, it can go below 4%. From the chart, we can see that Medisave interest rate was 6.5% from 1977 to 1985. Like the CPF account, it started to decline in 1986 after the government started to make changes that reduce the interest earned. Currently, the interest is at 4%, a big difference from 6.5% given previously. As the low interest rate is unable to compensate for high inflation, the government then resorted to encouraging the people to invest their CPF savings and equities for better returns. However, it was a disaster in 2008 for those who listened to this ill-timed advice and invested their CPF savings in unit trusts or stocks. As the stock market turns negative, many saw their investment down by half or more. The third factor is the lower contribution to the CPF from employers. CPF contribution by employer has been rising during the earlier years, topping at 25% in the mid-80s. Thereafter, it started to decline all the way down to 10% in 1999, as the government cut employers' contribution to the workers' CPF to lower their wage cost. Currently, employers' contribution stands at 14.5%. However, for older workers above 50 years of age, they will see their CPF from employers progressively being cut until 5% when they cross 65 years old. The government had defended this move to discriminate older workers, arguing that it will make them more attractive for employers to hire them. However, the result has proven otherwise, as older workers are still finding it hard to get a decent job. The next factor that affects the CPF savings is lower wages. When the economy was on the rise and inflation was surging, the government continues to depress the wage level. 
especially on the lower income workers. According to the union chief Lim Suise, this is to avoid a price wage spiral. Therefore, lower income workers are unable to benefit from the booming economy, and their CPF remains stagnant. However, when the economy starts to falter in 2008, the government were quick to encourage cutting wages to help businesses. Naturally, cutting wages meant reduction in CPF contribution. Nevertheless, the government continues to tell people to tighten their belts, even though many were suffering from the economic downturn, and barely able to survive on lower wages amid high inflation. Increasing public housing cost is another factor that has adversely affected CPF savings. More than 80% of Singaporeans live in HDB flats. Most, if not all, service their mortgages from their CPF savings. HDB prices have been rising rapidly since the beginning of 2007. With rising prices, amid stagnant or lower wages, any CPF saving will be depleted fast, leaving lesser money in the retirement account. Following the resale market trend, the government also sell new HDB flats at much higher prices. Despite all this, Housing Minister Ma Bautan had insisted that HDB prices are still affordable, as they are sold at a discount from resale market price. Next factor is the increasing medical cost. Hospital charges have been rising rapidly through the years. The health minister have warned that medical expenses will go up further in the future. Unable to bear the increase in medical cost, more Singaporeans are seeking free medical treatment from clinics run by welfare organizations. The danger of MediSave being totally depleted is so serious that the government is going to allow poor Singaporeans to use their MediSave when they go to Malaysia for cheaper treatment. Last but not least is unemployment. Latest report shows that Singapore unemployment rate surged to 3.2% in March 2009, which is much higher than what the government had predicted. It also warns that more retrenchment are expected, and the job market is bleak at the moment. In a separate report, DBS had forecasted job losses to exceed 99,000 in this year. No job means no CPF contribution. Therefore, Tens of thousands will not have any CPF contribution for a long time until they can get a job when the market improve. With all these factors working against the CPF, it is not surprising that this fund is now unable to meet the retirement needs of most Singaporeans. So, what are the government's solutions to tackle the issue of insufficient fund in the CPF for retirement? First, they opt to retain your CPF money for as long as possible by raising the minimum sum needed in the ordinary account, raising the CPF withdrawal aged, increase the amount needed to be transferred from the ordinary account to the non-withdrawal accounts, coming up with more schemes to withhold the CPF money like CPF life. Second, make Singaporeans work as long as possible by raising the age for retirement. The government will be raising the retirement age from 62 to 65 in 2012. Eventually, Singaporeans will be compelled to work beyond the age of 70. Reducing the employer's CPF contribution, making older workers cheaper to hire. Using incentive schemes, like workfare, to entice older workers to carry on working beyond their retirement age Many are dissatisfied with these solutions, criticizing the government for this regressive measures. Instead of finding ways to grow their CPF savings, they're locking away the CPF money for a longer period and forcing people to carry on working to their grave. This has left many Singaporeans to wonder, is CPF a social security or social bondage?